Well, thank you all for joining us today for our fall 2022 Artists in Residence talk for the Printing Museum's Artists in Residence program. So the Artists in Residence program is something that we started doing in 2020, which was a great year for that. And we are so excited to be able to share our working artist studios, because as the name suggests, the Printing Museum is indeed a museum, but we are so much more than that because we have wonderful collections that include all of this letterpress equipment. We have artist studios for letterpress, printmaking, paper making, and a book bindery. And on top of having the museum, the artist studios, we also have rotating gallery exhibit space. So we have a lot going on at the printing museum. But most importantly, we love sharing our collections and we want all of our equipment to be used. And so we are so thrilled to have our artists in residence here for our fall 2021 cohort. Uh, keeping track of the dates is tough. Um, <laughs> so I had to think for a moment. Also in our galleries at the moment, we have an exhibit called New Directions from our first two cohorts. And so I do wanna make sure and mention that that it's still up through January 30th, 2022. So it might be up a little longer than that, but definitely come by the Printing Museum here in Houston, Texas, and you can see New Directions. And it's the first survey of work created by the artists in the museum's Artists in Residence program. And the works on display represent the many diverse artistic outcomes achievable within the book arts disciplines of bookbinding, letterpress, printmaking, and papermaking. Each of these artists have learned from printing museums, teaching artists and used the studio resources in whole or in part entirely on site or mostly off site to create truly unique bodies of work. So that is up through January. And without further ado, I'm going to be handing it off to our artists in residence. So this cohort, we were lucky to have four artists in residence. We have Melissa Itenfisu, Gabby Hurtado Ramos, Oscar Maynard, and Ignacio Sanchez. So up first will be Melissa. She's gonna hand it off to the following artists. Keep your questions in mind or put them in the chat and we'll have Q&A at the end. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks for the intro, Adrian. Um, hi everybody. I'm coming to you live from the lithography studio at the Printing Museum. So I can show you some of the stuff after. Actually, the wall behind me has a lot of the supplies that we use. Um, I have loved this residency so much. Um, I'm here all the time, as much as I can be. And um, it, it's just been fantastic. It's a fantastic place as an artist. It's like a dream. All these old fashioned presses and, and letters and blocks and so much to learn. So yes, I have been here a lot. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna do a slideshow of some of my work to kind of tell the story of what I've been up to. So we practice this, so I should be able to share screen. You're doing great. And I love that your background, you are at the lithography studio, which is so yeah. exciting. I'm gonna go to full screen. Okay, so this is the very first piece that I did on my own. Um, and it's a letterpress piece on the Vandercook Press. Um, my whole time here, I focused on creating work for an exhibition I'm planning to have in 2022. And the title of my exhibition will be COVID Masks Unmasked. So it's um, a theme that I've been developing a lot of times my artwork reflects kind of what's happening in the world around me. And so we've all been living through COVID for the last two years now. So um, for me, this is what just bubbled up from my inspiration. Um, this first piece is a quote by Malcolm X. Um, and it was just really fun using the different colors, putting the X in the background. Um, as I walk around the printing museum, I get inspired by different pieces I see hanging up and I come and find the studio manager, Jessica, and I'm like, Jessica, how do they do that? How do they make that color? How do they? So she's been very patiently um, coaching me the last few months. So education is the passport to the future for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Um, this piece for me is related to the pandemic because uh, I feel like COVID really exposed a lot of inequalities in our society and things that hopefully we can change. But with school shutting down, it just felt like 
the wealthier, more privileged um, families were able to organize themselves into learning pods and hire private tutors and help their children stay on track educationally. Or they had the privilege of having a parent home with kids. Um, and a lot of families didn't have that. And so there's articles talking about how the, um, the gap in education was in some ways um, exacerbated by COVID. And uh, again, something that, again, COVID, it just really unmasked things that already existed, but maybe we hadn't paid as much attention to. Okay. This piece, again, working with letters, um, this is called, this is a rainbow print in the background. I also learned how to do that. So these are streets that I live near. Um, something really hard during the pandemic, which maybe people can relate to is being quarantined to your neighborhood or your area. Um, at one point during the pandemic, I tried to take my kids to a park. I was quarantining with a, oh, how old, a two and a four-year-old, very active kids. And we were getting bored of the park in our neighborhood. So we went to a park in another neighborhood and a security guard was questioning why I was parking and telling me, well, no, the order says you have to just go to parks you can walk to. So for me, it felt like this was where I was limited to being. But I also love these streets and I love this neighborhood. Can you hear me okay? Because it's kind of raining hard in the studio. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear the rain a bit, but I can hear you. Okay, but you can hear me, okay. Um, this one is more practice on the letterpress using different layers, using different colors. I really enjoyed that piece. This piece says hope in Amharic, which is the ling one of the um, main languages of Ethiopia. And I actually had to carve these letters out, which got me to thinking about the history of print and, and letterpress and um, basically of print all over the world in different countries. And I was talking to one of the professors who uses the studio and he was saying one of his assignments for students is to look up the history of printing in other, in other countries. And right in the beginning of the, the museum here, there's a, a geese, which is like a handwritten Bible, I think, from Ethiopia, from, I don't want to mess up the year, but that inspired me to try to write something in Amharic. So I had to send this to my dad to make sure that I was doing it correctly. <laughs> so it is correct. It says hope. Um, I feel like a lot of my work was getting very, <laughs> talking about all the difficult things in the pandemic. Um, and then there was also, there's a very bad war going on in Ethiopia right now. So I felt like I needed to change the narrative and, and write a hopeful word. So I wrote hope. Then I wrote hope in different languages. <laughs> so I have hope, espoir, esperar in Spanish and French and English. Um, and in the background of this is pressure printing. So I pressure printed with masks and then I used um, some of the cleaning medium to make these little dots, mineral spirits. So this was me getting a little creative with the press. Um, Again, seeing stuff around the gallery and thinking, oh, can I do that? Can I try that? Like, I wanna try that. Um, this piece I'm gonna title COVID Economics. And for a lot of the pandemic, I would like look up every, and I've stopped doing it now, but I would look up every day the, um, the numbers in Houston. And so you can see the first surge, the second surge, the third surge. And um, what I did is as the, as the lines go downward, the lines kind of fall apart. Um, and to me, it was kind of saying how people under a certain socioeconomic status have been really a lot more impacted. Um, black and brown communities, a lot more impacted by the pandemic than more affluent communities. So above the line, it's just a straight line. Like for people who could afford to and who had jobs, they could afford to work from home. Their lives just kept kind of on a straight track. But the farther down you are in society, the more likely things were to fall apart, losing your job or, or being sent to work because you're a first line worker driving a bus and you know, it just affected families differently. Okay, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is lithography. I got really into, um, I got lucky to help get the lithography studio up and running. So when I first uh, came to the museum, they had all the stuff here, the pieces were there, but just not all the supplies. And it just, there was, we had to get it together and it's taken a few months. And again, thanks to Jessica and me always knocking on the door, can we order this please? And can we order this? And calling universities. But we have now fully stocked the lithography studio for the first time in a few years. Um, 
since another artist, Charles Krino, used to do lithography here. And I got to make my first three lithography prints last week. And I'm so excited. And I just want to make more, 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 more. Um, this is my first stone. It's a limestone. So for those of you who don't know with lithography, you draw on a limestone with um, uh, like a rubber um, greasy pencil with grease. And then it's like a water repellent um, gum Arabic is put on it. This is actually the inspiration for my artwork. This is near where I was born in Alberta in Canada on the prairies. I'm a prairie girl. And um, I couldn't go home during the pandemic for oh, 18 months. And I would check every day or every month. On the 21st of every month, they would put out what the travel restrictions were. And they were just, every month, it would continue to be restricted between Canada and the United States. And it was so hard. <laughs> So this um, artwork for me is kind of like hope that it was finally broken. So this is some of the um, prints that I pulled. Very first print, uh, it worked out really well. This is uh, my last photo I'm showing you. This is in my neighborhood at Emancipation Park um, during COVID, my son playing chess with some older gentlemen at the park. So just like a day-to-day -day scene. I do a lot of um, images of my children in my artwork like some other artists in the past have done because that's who I'm always around. <laughs> okay, um, I think that's it for me. Let me, how, how do I get out of this full screen? And I'm going to pass it on. Uh, let me get back here. Okay, um, stop sharing. And I'm going to pass the mic to my partner, Gabby Hurtado. Hi, thank you so much, Melissa. Love seeing your work more. Um, and thank you everybody at the Printing Museum. It's been really awesome to be here for the past couple months. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right. So while I was printing here at the Printing Museum, I focused on a project um, making a zine called Let's Get Acquainted. Um, it was, it's a small publication that I made on the Rizzograph and it's part of a series exploring historic lesbian bars of Houston. Oops, there we go. Um, so here's a close up of the inside of the pages. And like I said, it was printed on the Rizzograph, which is a printer that's kind of like a copy machine and kind of like a screen printing process where each color is one layer and you can get these super bright colors. And you can also get this kind of grainy texture that makes gray values. So I focused my project on lesbian bars in Houston because as someone who recently moved back and is from Houston, I've always known that Montrose and Houston in general has a long history of being like a meeting place and having a vibrant LGBTQ community, especially around the bar scene. But I felt a little disconnected from where is that or what is happening now or what was it like before? So I wanted to look more into that. And I wanted to focus on bars because they, while they are only a portion of the queer community, they are very important meeting spaces for people, especially before the present time may have not been able to be out in all of parts of their lives. So the bar was a very important spot to meet other gay and queer people. So in this project, I also chose to focus on women's bars or usually what they're, they're called lesbian bars because gay bars can be very centered around men and being a man focused space. And there weren't as many lesbian bars around in Houston or in most cities in the US. Um, 
And so sometimes there were spaces that like you could see in this poster that were like separated or there might have be a night that's like focused for women, but, and it's not like gay bars weren't welcoming of everybody, but there definitely was a particular clientele and a particular group of people who would frequent the male focused bars. Another reason that I wanted to focus on women's bars was because they have been closing a lot. Lem lesbian bars have been closing um, into the present day. I think there's only like a handful left in the US and there's only two, I think in Texas. One that's still open here in Houston is Pearl Bar. So I just wanted to know more about where, how many lesbian bars existed in Houston and where were they, when did they exist? So I found this website that's a really awesome archive called HoustonLGBTQHistory.org. It's part of the JD Doyle archives. Um, and there's an individual named JD Doyle who has been putting together this incredible resource of ads and community knowledge and research from other researchers and friends. And it's just a really great wealth of information. This is a page that's focusing just on bars. You can see a list of the different titles. Each of those is a hyperlink. And I would just like go in there and find a bunch of information on all of them and find out like, okay, where are the lesbian bars? Because most of these were catered towards gay men. Oh yeah, and thanks Adrian for sharing that site. All right, so here is a cover of a small publication called This Week in Texas. This is an example of the primary source material you could find on the J.D. Doyle archives. And it was a very important publication out of many where queer people could find what events were happening, what bars were in their city. And this publication in particular, it was weekly. It was, I have one here, it was like this size and you could find them in different places, share them with people and find out like where to meet your community. Here's another cover. Most of them had gay men on the covers. There are very few with women, but I tried to find some of them. And here's an example of some ads that you might find inside. So I was looking, prior to doing the zine and print project, I was looking at these ads and just spending a lot of time like getting to know what bar was where, what would the bar be like since I can't go back in time and go inside. I wanted to see like what kind of vibes were in each one, what kind of clientele or audience were they trying to attract, what kind of events were happening. You can see um, at, on the right, Mistake 2 advertises live amateur female wrestling, which I thought was pretty funny. On the left, you can see people are dancing. So some of these bars were more about dancing, while others might advertise themselves as a quiet bar, which is, I could read as like a, an, an alternative to a loud, like thumping disco bar. Maybe some people wanted a place to sip wine quietly <laughs> in the dark. Um, there's also like aquarium room is advertised in one of these. It was just really great to look at all of this. So these are all also lesbian bars. This is a photo in my studio where the beginning of the project, I'm looking at all these images from the archive, printing them out, putting them together, thinking about sequential art. I knew I wanted to make a book, um, also making my own drawings and thinking about like the buildings and the kinds of feelings that were being evoked in these ads. One of the first parts that I did for this project prior to being one of the artists in residence was were these screen printed posters that have a bunch of the ads and photographs collaged together and screen printed on these neon sheets that envisioned being stapled around Montrose to kind of show what Montrose used to be, which is the neighborhood where a lot of the gay bars were, and some still are. 
So like I said, I decided to use the risograph printer to make my zine. This is an example of how the inks look. We had four colors, black, blue, pink, and yellow. And like I said, they can do different gradation gradations depending like how dark the blacks were for the stencils that you scan or send in. This should be a video of the printing. Just to show you the speed. So that's an example of like, at the end of the process, it's pretty easy. It just prints out, but the preparation and putting the book together is what takes most of the time. Um, another reason to choose a risograph for a book is you can get a lot of copies in a short period of time. So here's a picture of the pages once they were printed. I had them, I trimmed them and collated them, printed them full bleed. So I got those like really bright colors. Here are some test prints I did for the covers. As you can see, when you use a risograph, you there's a drawing that is what I'm calling the stencil, but I could try out different colors and see how it, they looked together. So this is me looking at different combinations. This is the final where I just added a third color, blue, and it turns like this nice purple when it's overlaid on the pink that I really like. Here's a photo of the books uh, all stapled and trimmed and put together at the end, which was very satisfying. And here's the beginning. Um, I had a little table of contents and there's a photo below um, of the inside of Just Marion and Lynn's, which was one of the popular lesbian bars. At the beginning of the book, I made a guide of the bars that I was looking at in my research. Some of them were listed on the website that I showed at the beginning, the JD Doyle archives, and some of them I had to find looking at different bar ads and finding what year that publication was that the ad was in and kind of guessing like when the bar might've closed if I couldn't find more information. So I consolidated everything here in order of when the bars opened starting in 1965 and going through 2014. So it's five decades of lesbian bars in Houston. I had their addresses and the years. And this is also overlaid over the pink layer you see is from a scan of like one of the original This Week in Texas guides. So I wanted to draw that connection because a big part of the This Week in Texas publications was that people could find like where the bars were and other places like bookstores and other businesses where you could meet others. Following the guide, I made a map where I just the list of bars from the guide are all placed on this overlaid on a Google map in Houston so that I can invite people to take a walk or think differently about their surroundings and what was there before, because these are all bars that have closed. There's also a QR code on this page where it leads the viewer to a Google map that I made. So you could pull it up on your phone and like make a walking trail or kind of see where everything is. And some of the bars are listed twice because they moved locations at one point. Following those more concrete pages, I used collage um, and drawing and writing to make my own present day engagements with the, um, with the archive. So this is a page where I'm thinking about like what does it mean when a lesbian bar advertises themselves as like quiet and soft and an alternative and for women and not as like clubby. So I was thinking about those ideas and I wrote a little poem. And then on this page, I'm thinking, I was looking at how there were ads for vacations. You can see I 
um, Drew on top of a, an ad for cruise ship. And then also on the right, that is an image from Crystals, which was a very shortly opened lesbian bar, but I added some of my own words at the top. So I was thinking about a different kind of vibe that you might find in a bar where people are trying to look with each other, look at each other, people are trying to flirt, meet each other. This next page, um, I was focusing on one location specifically, which was Chances, which was a bar that was open in 1994 through 2010 um, on Westheimer and Wa current and now it is currently a steakhouse called Georgia James. Before that, it was a different bar com called the Rendezvous Club, and I included a picture on the right of Chances when it was being de demolished, and then below that is a picture of the restaurant that is there today. And on the left, you can see it's a picture from 1979 Pride Parade in Houston. And if you can make out, there's people sitting on top of a building over here, and that's Mary's, which is a very well-known, long-running gay bar that was right by Chances. So that's a summary of the zine. Um, in addition to the zine, I also made some of these posters. I think there's one behind me. Um, thinking about the country Western vibes that could exist in a lesbian bar, looking at photos and just wanting to draw people dancing together. For this print, I also did hand-drawn stencils. So this is like a transparency, me drawing with a waxy pencil on top of a, a sketch below. And like I said, with Rizzo, you can get these really nice colors and these really nice like grain textures when you look up close. So I enjoyed that a lot. And lastly, at the end of this whole project, I made this poster that I imagine as like a takeaway broadside, a poster that people can keep or put up in different places that has again the guide that I have and the zine of the lesbian bars that have since closed in Houston, along with a couple collaged images, one of a map of Houston with different gay bar listings and then another below is a photo inside it cropped that you probably saw before in the zine inside Marion and Lynn's. And Marion and Lynn's was a bar that was also open, a longer running lesbian bar that was open from 73 to 87. This is a photo of me printing at the printing and demonstration. So we had an event just this last weekend at the printing museum where people could come and see how the last layer was pulled on the Vandercook press. I had the color as a split fountain. So I had a blend from silver to neon pink. And for each of the layers for this print, I used polymer plates for the first time, which was really cool. They're basically um, a type of plastic that is made from a file. So I made it on my computer, sent it off to a press that produces these plates and then you can put that on a base and put it through the press. So it's its own relief process. I did that along with some metal type too. Here's a photo of the plate when it's all like inked up with a bright pink. Here's an image of another layer I did on the top that says the guide. And I, I did another rainbow roll for that one, um, bright neon pink to bright blue. And here's the original um, piece of information that I used to make that map of Gay Houston from an older publication. And this is what it looks like as a plate. So you lose some detail, but you also get this boldness as if it were a type. That's the print after it's going from silver to neon pink. And there's a close up that I really like um, from the photo in Marion and Lynn's. And to make that gray, again, like the solar plate has these little tiny specks similar to the risograph that make these nice gray tones. That is the end of my talk. 
Thank you so much for tuning in. And this is a little sneak peek of another print that I want to make sometime this week for a little card. But thank you so much. I'm going to stop my screen sharing and pass the mic to Oscar. Thanks, Gabby. Um, let me get to... presentation. Okay. So I go by Oscar. I use they, them pronouns. Um, and I am actually a letterpress printer. Um, the press is very much my medicine and it's kind of where I pray and it's where I make the medicine that I make for my community, for whoever finds it resonant. Um, I started Tender Heart Press um, December 31st in 2016 in Oakland. Um, I was working out of Kala Art Institute at that time. And so New Year's Eve is my press anniversary. I spend every New Year's Eve at the press, which is irritating to some of my partners, but they, make room for it. Um, so I moved away from the Bay Area and I moved to Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico, and then Northern New Mexico. And I had no access to the press. So I would end up driving six hours to Silver City, New Mexico, to Power and Light Press, which is owned by Kyle Dury, who's um, a lovely and generous human. Um, who would let me work in her shop. And so I would go and have little printmaking stations there. And I made this paper cut, this is the drawing for the paper cut, to, um, to call a press into my life. So it is a, a prayer for my own press, which I do now have. Um, this is Power and Light. Uh, that little challenge press down there on the floor is the one that I was always working on. And I would just haul in all of my type and bakery boxes and set them up on these um, tables and, and do um, what I do. So being at the printing museum has been such a gift um, to have an entire five weeks to just be on press and think through things and come back to this thing that I, um, that I love so much. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I have worked in the past and then some of the things that I did when I was at the museum. So I make layered posters and I'm, I'm borrowing this style from Amos P. Kennedy. Uh, he is my mentor and a huge inspiration. Um, his work drew me into letterpress actually. And there's a documentary about him called Proceed and Be Bold, which I highly recommend. Um, and this color block technique that you see in the background of this poster is, is his. Um, and it's basically created using a piece of melamine board. So like shelving from the hardware store that you cut down to a certain size, make type high and then run through the press to get this solid block of color. Um, and then I would layer text on top of that. So that's three layers. This is what would be the key block um, if you were like a woodcut artist. And then that's all of the layers together. And most of what I make, I write myself. Um, and so these are very much spells and prayers and calling in um, what's possible. It's a place where imagination is pretty central. Okay. Um, I also did a few uh, photopolymer plates. I designed the um, sort of watermark kind of image in the middle, which I now know what that is, thanks to Kathy Gerwell at the Printing Museum. Um, and I swiped the, uh, the passport stamps from the internet and then layered wood type on top of that. Right before I left the Bay Area, I wanted to make a more cohesive um, series of posters because I have been doing one-offs. And so this series kind of imagines the ways that humans are a living prayer an embody prayer or a living monument or a living altar. Uh, this was created in Detroit um, at Amos's shop using his beautiful wood type collection. 
And this is a prayer to um, heal some of the damage that my family line has um, done in the world. So when I get to the printing museum, um, I'm, I'm actually based in Atlanta for right now. And I launched a little fundraiser to be able to pay for my time here, housing and all the expenses. And so one of the things that I offered was a, um, a custom poster. And I realized in the process of being here that um, a lot of folks really just don't understand the letterpress process. So I made a, a time-lapse video of laying a very, a very basic poster. It's um, seven words and two bits of uh, decorative rule, but it's pretty time consuming. So um, I made this time-lapse to show folks um, how, <clears throat> how it goes. Uh, and this is a section from the Torah that was selected by the owner of Five Pins Project in San Francisco. Um, she runs an acupuncture clinic there and she actually has her own signboard and she selects the most beautiful and right quotes for the moment um, and puts them out on the sidewalk. So, and then I added this to a, a series of time-lapse videos um, called Demystifying Letterpress on my Instagram account, um, just to sort of make the process uh, clear for folks. So um, I describe it as a game of Tetris that you have to win when you're doing a lockup. Um, this one's this one's pretty all right, but you can see there's a lot of adjustment. There's putting paper under the, the letters that are not gonna that are not printing right. And then there's fiddling and realizing you want, you know, to shift half of the poster in the other direction and then doing that. And then that's the finished piece. Um, I got to go through all of the uh, cuts and found this lovely little lawn chair and made a um, one of the other perks for the fundraiser with a, a postcard. Um, I am from the South. Uh, I grew up in South Carolina, lived in Georgia for a while, but uh, Houston is next level. Y'all's mosquitoes are still on 10. Um, it is... <laughs> And it's still summer down here, <laughs> which is great. I love summer. Um, so I applied for residency at the Printing Museum uh, this year and last year. And last year, um, one of the projects I proposed was coming back to an idea to do with paper wasp nests. Um, and so when my letterpress brain is working, um, it's sort of this lens through which I can see almost everything. And I know it's really going when I drive down the street and all I notice is the typeface on all of the signs and the billboards. Um, and so this letterpress lens brought me to these paper wasps and I realized they're actually making paper. They're doing um, what we do. They, they go to the wood and chew the pulp and then craft um, these hexagon shapes that they, you know, live in or put eggs in, and then also the exterior, which is this beautiful papery newsprinty kind of um, uh, shell. And so a couple of years ago, I made a first run, um, but because I'm a purist, I wanted to do what the wasps do, and I really wanted to make my own paper to make the nest. So this is a this is a prototype that I made a couple of years ago, and then this is the paper that I was able to make with Kathy. Um, it's using abaca, and she showed me how to um, get really really thin sheets, which I think are actually going to be beautiful when I come back to this project again. And this is actually the project that I proposed for this past year. Um, again, thinking about uh, the connections between letterpress and the rest of the world. I um, was in Detroit for a conference and was seeing these signboards and I was realizing that the same uh, innovation that we do as letterpress printers um, when we run out of something is um, that folks who lay signboards are also doing. So if you run out of black letters, you use a red one. If you run out of an E, you 
flip a three around. Um, and that's what I wanted to explore here. Um, got kind of meta because signboards are a tool of advertising and advertising is a function of capitalism. And so then I needed to think about um, capitalism in relation to this, to this form. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the technical part of it and the conceptual part um, at the end. I tested a lot of different materials. I knew that I wanted a, a frosted kind of um, surface to work on. So I chose mylar, drafting film, and vellum. Vellum is actually cotton. The other two are um, polyester. And so they print really differently. I did a first run using the ink that the um, printing museum had on hand, which is mostly rubber-based stuff. Um, but rubber-based oil dries through absorption and oil-based dries through oxidation. So this was never gonna absorb into a plastic sheet. Um, and Jess um, thankfully uh, got us some oil-based stuff to try, which went a lot better. And so this is just me layering, you know, the kind of reds, the blacks, and then the base layer. Uh, the, the rubber base stuff had a sheen to it that I really loved. The oil was a little more dull, but um, it still looked good. So this is the oil based stuff on all of those materials that I just showed. And then this is me figuring out on scrap paper how to build a sign board. Um, and there were, there were a lot of considerations um, the press size was a thing. I totally <laughs> spaced it and thought I could work 24 by 36 and um, then had to scale it back to 18 by 24. Um, but I ended up using uh, a rubber that we adhered to a base and ran through the press. Um, so these are the two presses um, that I use most often. The Vander Cook Universal One, I did the smaller stuff on. And then the 425 on the left, um, is the one that I did these larger signboard prints on. This is the SBR rubber um, on the base. I should have chose melamine, but I ended up with marker board. And as you can see, it kind of rips up when you try to reposition using the um, uh, repositionable adhesive from boxcar base, uh, boxcar press. And then I just used, um, two very thin sections of rule to print the, uh, the lines that the text went on. And so then eventually we had a finished, um, finished signboard template, uh, a bit more measuring. And um, I realized I could put 20 line type in those slots and a bit more testing. Um, first two lines are 20 line. Uh, the last line is 15 line and I was just deciding, you know, what I liked and what I felt looked authentic. And then this is me thinking through the conceptual stuff. So um, I was thinking about what capitalism invites and what it demands from us, um, how we have to move within it and how, of course, we don't often see its demands. We just move within them. Um, and I also imagined a, a possibility in which capitalism was sort of a character and then the divine was sort of a character and there were all of these characters that were talking to each other or would occasionally get to, you know, write the message for the signboard and what would they say um, differently. So I had a paragraph that I whittled down to about a sentence and then I, I started laying that. And I realized that the content was actually more important than having the, the letters mirror the signboard exactly. And so I laid type in the way that I normally lay type, which is um, uh, varied. Uh, this is the lockup. It is not Tetris. It went mostly okay. And then this is the finished, um, finished piece. And I just wanna say, um, I am really appreciating the Printing Museum for uh, this residency program 
and for the way that I see your values embodied and how you've how you're running it and how you um, support us um, and just super grateful. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Ignacio Sanchez. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be here and I really appreciate the residency that I took with uh, the printing museum and I greatly appreciate it. Oops, it's kind of greasy. All right, sharing my screen here. Okay, I'm gonna start with a brief introduction and then I'll go into the work that I've started with the, uh, with the printing museum. So my name's Ignacio Luis Sanchez. Uh, I go by Nacho and I'm a Mexican American artist that, uh, that's recognized by the colors and patterns and repetition that I do in my work. Um, I like to experiment with large scale murals, paintings, and uh, now paper making. I've used uh, pastels, acrylics, oil bars, and uh, mostly aeros aerosol paint in my works. Um, I've also uh, had the opportunity to work with uh, carpentry over at the uh, wood shop at the University of Houston. Um, in the recent years, I've been able to travel to Mexico and South America, which I've had the opportunity to uh, get influenced by a lot of the colors that, that uh, are in the textiles in uh, the Latin American culture. Um, you know, so I really love working with uh, different shapes, colors, and uh, textures in my work. Um, I currently reside in the historical uh, Third Ward, which is uh, not too far from uh, where I'm working at. Um, so it's, uh, you know, by the University of Houston and uh, TSU area. Um, you know, I also had the opportunity to, te to teach some youth art classes in the undeserved, under, uh, I apologize, undeserved neighborhoods of, uh, of Houston. And uh, so I recently received a bachelor of, bachelor's in arts uh, from the University of Houston to be able to further develop my, uh, my processes. And my latest exhibitions are uh, currently at, um, well, in the past, at um, the Holocaust Museum through the Smithsonian Traveling Exhibition for the Dolores Huerta uh, show. Uh, revolution in the fields and I've also had the opportunity to show at the uh, at the station museum which is currently up um, which took place uh, last year last summer and uh, if you have a chance an opportunity to go by it's by um, ACC Central across the street from uh, Axelrad um, off of Alabama and uh, here's my work for the uh, printing museum I really enjoyed the fact that uh, you guys chose me for this uh, residency. Here are some of the previous works that I've had the opportunity to work with before getting to the printing museum. I, um, I've used uh, various found papers and uh, newspapers and uh, basically made a big mush and created my own paper. And uh, here's another piece that I've had the opportunity to work on. Um, and for the first portion of the project, I, um, I was able to collect uh, many newspapers from, uh, from relatives that traveled to Mexico. So I, um, I kind of just mashed those up, uh, multiply them in a blender. And I've also put them together with uh, like various Amazon boxes that I often get in the mail. And I've been, uh, I've been uh, repurposing them to make my art. So here's a, a view of me at home teaching a workshop. Uh, with a few of my friends. Uh, be sure to share your screen. If you're sharing it, we aren't able to see it yet. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. We wouldn't want to miss out on that. <laughs> okay. I, uh... Okay. There we go. Have you... Wait. Oh. Well, come once more. Okay. So I totally messed that one up. No, you're fine. <laughs> We aren't seeing it yet, but I'll just give you a minute to get that going. Oh, my God. And so as a reminder, while you work on that to everybody, if you have questions, we'll have Q&A at the end. And then after that, you know, we'll stop recording it so that everybody we can all um, informally chat. Perfect. You got it going, Ignacio. I will hand it back to you. OK, so let me just go ahead and uh, let you see some of my work. So here's the uh, 
Holocaust Museum pieces. And here is the, uh, you can still see my screen, right? Yes, uh, okay. yes, perfect. Here is the uh, piece at the uh, Station Museum that's currently up and you can go ahead and take a look at that. And then uh, here's some of the work that I started before um, being at the Printing Museum. And here's another piece that I really love. And uh, here's a photo of me working at home, uh, teaching a workshop with a few of my friends, uh, using a blender and uh, using various uh, flowers and uh, uh, found uh, plants at home uh, to press in between the papers, which uh, I find that it's uh, really interesting to get all these different textures in it. Um, yeah. And here is a uh, some of the pieces that I've worked on with the collected newspapers that my relatives were able to bring from uh, various parts of Mexico. And that's a mixture of newspapers, uh, flowers, and um, paper boxes from Amazon. And um, also here is uh, a photo of me working with uh, Kathy. She, uh, she showed me a lot of great techniques over there with the deco and the uh, Abaca paper. Um, so basically my project is rooted, rooted with, uh, in identity. And uh, I really wanted to play with that aspect just because uh, my, my father was born in Mexico and my mother was born in the United States. And often, you know, you, you're not really categorized as being a Mexican or being an American. So I figured that that, that would really, um, you know, uh, interest many people. Um, so I really wanted to build off on that idea. And uh, here's one of the uh, papers that I had the opportunity to press at home. I, uh, to get it nice and flat, I use my own cardboard and I find it that it, um, it creates a great texture to paint on. And I really love the speckles and, uh, and the plant matter that it creates in between the, the paper. And here are some of the finished pieces that I had had finished with uh, with a mixture of the Abaca paper that I uh, learned to make with with Kathy and some of the newspaper uh, uh, pieces that I was able to put together. So the concept was to basically make find the newspaper, make the paper and um, let it dry. And uh, after it was finished dry, finishing drying. I was um, tearing it up and then I would go and uh, paint it and collage it back together. So this is my concept for, for the project. I feel that it's gonna be an ongoing project for, um, for the coming year, just because I wanna be able to practice it and uh, define my work a little bit more. And here are a couple more pieces that I was able to put together and uh, just experimenting with the Abaca paper and the uh, newspaper. Um, that I made. And these are a few of the other pieces that I had the opportunity to make. And I basically just put them together. And uh, like I mentioned before, I plan to uh, take some more of the fine art paper that I made at the printing museum, uh, tear it up and spray paint it and use uh, some fine uh, tape so I could be able to make my uh, fine lines and textures. And uh, again, here's some more of the paper that I made. Uh, I really enjoy making this paper just because uh, it's handmade paper. And uh, I think it gives my work a lot more meaning. And um, yeah. And here's my contact information. If you guys uh, want to reach out to me, any of the resident artists, you know, if you're ever willing to collaborate with any of the paper or any printing press, you know, I'll be happy to help you guys. So you can find me at uh, isanchez1105 at gmail.com. And my website is www.elartedenacho.com. And my Instagram is uh, at elnacho1105. All right, and uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much. I put that in the chat. So if you guys want to put your other contact info in the chat or any other links, feel free. Now is our Q&A portion. 
So if you had any questions for the artist, feel free to unmute yourselves or put it in the chat and I'll be happy to read them out for you guys. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure having all of our artists at the studios and coming to an end, we're gonna miss you all. Um, so also that reminder that we have our current cohorts, um, our preceding cohorts art on display. Our current cohort will also be donating uh, one of their arts. Um, they will be adding to our permanent collection. And so we will also have their artwork on display at a future date at the printing museum. So stay tuned for that too. I have a question for Gabby. <laughs> Gabby, I, I love the two women on the front and their cowboy clothing. And I love the color. Um, how did you, did you draw those two? Did you sketch them? Did you, how did you make them? Is that your own drawing or is that from a found place? Yeah. Um, it's, it's my own drawing, but then I was looking at the, the last poster I made with like the bright pink two cowgirls next to the list. Mm -hmm. I was looking at that image, which was actually just one pink cowgirl. And then I like doubled it. And then I was looking at that image and made my own drawing of thinking of different, a different scene, but inspired by that print that was in originally in like a, a zine basically, or like a publication. Okay, there's just so much to analyze and how their yeah. bodies are, how one is tilting towards the other and just, it's just a really strong image. I like it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I have a question for Ignacio. Um, Ignacio, can you talk a little bit about um, how you choose your patterns to represent identity you were, you were talking about that um thinking about those ideas of where your identity with your american born mom and your mexican born dad and i was wondering how that influenced your your patterns in particular yeah absolutely so i really like to do some research um on the different textiles that that people wear um as far as the dresses and uh, the architecture if you're familiar with uh with mexico they like to use really bright colors in their uh, in their buildings, so I really like to use a lot of the uh, a lot of the colors. So they like to use a lot of like magentas, um, a lot of blues. Uh, if you're familiar with the Casa Azul Sul in um, in Mexico City from Frida Kahlo, um, I really like those those colors as well. So I guess by uh, I guess I can say that I'm really influenced by the architecture, uh, the architecture colors and the, uh, the dresses that the ladies wear. Um, I feel that the lines and the textures in the, uh, in the dresses uh, really calls to me. Thank you. And uh, really appreciated too, Gabby and Melissa, you both explained some of those artistic methods. I mean, you all did on the paper making, but especially for me, risograph and lithography are some of those um, like photography, those more magical kind of like it comes together. Um, so I really appreciated you sharing that, um, those processes with us too, for those of us that aren't as familiar with them. No problem. I, I have a question uh, for Oscar. If um, I want to, do you have more to share about your choice with using that acetate, or I don't know if that's what it, the transparent paper that you printed your um, that letterpress print on? Um, let's see. Well, I kind of got what I wanted from it. Um, but if I had all the time in the world, the way that I would do it, I think, is um, to print a, a block, which I did, but you can't really tell, um, using the um, high gloss overprint varnish. And then one of my ideas that I tested was to turn the type over and put a vinyl sheet on the back and then um, have uh you know how if you were laying a signboard, you'd pick up one of the letters and it would be sort of in a plastic rectangle. 
I, I kind of, I want that as, as part of it. Um, once I have something small enough to fit into that space, um, but I want to see what that would look like. And I want actually to try, Jess had suggested weathering them a little bit, like putting a, a tiny bit of yellow ink into the varnish and um, making them sort of like, this is a new one, new letter, and this is an old letter. And you can kind of see that variation. Um, so yeah, that's what I would like to do when I get to come back around to it. I really like too how you had a couple photos of the print installed like with different walls behind it. I thought that yeah. was really interesting. It was all the museum. It was fun. <laughs> I did recognize, yeah, a few of those backgrounds. <laughs> yeah. Right. Our studio walls. Mm -hmm. Well, do we have any other questions from the audience? Just be mindful and appreciative of everybody's time. We'll otherwise wrap up unless there's one more. All right. Yes, I wanted to ask Oscar a question. Did you find it hard to come do the residency over here in Houston and you're stationed somewhere else? That's a great question. Um, yeah, kind of, yeah. Um, not because I'm not used to going wherever, but um, you know, when I lived in the Bay Area, I structured my life so that I could do residencies and pause all of my jobs and come back to them. Um, but I think it was hard this time because I am, uh, I don't really have a permanent place to live. So I'm sleeping on friends' floors. I don't have any income. So it felt um, difficult to navigate logistically, um, which is why I did the fundraiser. But I, I just, I really needed it. I haven't had access to a press and like steady access to a press in so long. And so I prioritized it. It is doable, um, yeah. I appreciate that. Oscar, yeah, is our first artist that isn't local to the Houston area. Um, and so we, we really appreciated you coming and um, yes, what it took. We appreciate and understand this. Absolutely. Logistically a bit more for you. Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you all, but feel free to stay on if you wanted to say hi to any family members or friends, and I'll be posting this online for anyone that missed it.